Yes. And uh, <clears throat> welcome everyone today uh, to our uh, March, March, yeah, the March uh, uh, PSG webinar. Today we have uh, Dr. Catalina Lundberg. Uh, Catalina is PhD and structural geologist and expert for the structural validation of geologic settings worldwide, as well as the ex exploration of their energy and mineral potential. Uh, she has worked in the oil and gas sector in companies such as Halliburton Geologic Systems in Midland Valley, developing and applying structural modeling techniques in 2D and 3D restoration and balancing projects as well as software development and training. Uh, she is the owner of Terra X Group, LLC, a geoscience training and consulting company with a diverse expert team <clears throat> worldwide. Currently, she is applying her expertise uh, across industry at Newmont, Newmont Corporation, uh, the industry leader in gold mining. Um, today, Catalina is going to be speaking on utilizing structural modeling workflows to predict natural fracture networks, an example from Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Um, <clears throat> I ask uh, if you have questions, please submit to them to the, the chat or Q&A and uh, Catalina will address them at the end. Uh, thank you, and I pass it on to you, Catalina. Thank you, and thank you, Molly and the Peace PSGD for inviting me to give this presentation. Kind of excited giving this presentation, also because we just um, got it um, published. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some structural modeling workflows and how they can be useful for natural fraction networks. And I'm using the Tipodome in Wyoming as a case study because of the publicly avail available uh, data set. I also want to mention my co-authors, um, Daniel Roberts, Derong Jin, and Jun Kato. They're all with Rockfield Global. And um, we kind of did this project together, um, approaching it from a kinematic as well as a mechanical modeling side. So, when we look at this picture, we see some um, energy mineral resources that are kind of critical to our society. We look at unconventional, also conventional hydrocarbon exploration, carbon capture, geothermal energy, nuclear energy, waste, mineral or metal deposits of, of different styles. And when you think about um, the, the geology behind them, and I have to say they're not all producing resources, but also dealing with um, the products of um, producing these resources. Um, we, we tend to think about larger scale structures such as um, large faults and shear zones or, or folding, um, but really mostly unknown to, to people that are using these resources, of course, with the exception of us geologists, is that it is a very small geologic feature, in fact, that um, plays an important role in the successful exploration and also use of these resources, such as uh, uh, fractures. So what is exactly the role that fractures play in all these sources? So th the common factor is how fractures control fluids um, and how fluids move rocks. So in, in some cases, we need um, very efficient fluid flow, whether it's for oil and gas or mineral or metal rich fluids moving through or hot temperature fluids as in thermal, geothermal um, case. In other cases, we um, need to contain the fluids, such as in the case of carbon capture and storage, nuclear waste, or anywhere where rocks are acting as, as a seal. So the role of fractures, what are fractures? Fractures are discontinuities, structural discontinuities in rocks as kind of a sign of loss of, of cohesion on a, on, a, on a small level, let's say, that form as a product of mechanical rupture. Um, but mostly important is that fractures um, affect the porosity and permeability of rocks. So the porosity is the space basically within the rock that um, 
um, has the ability to hold a fluid. And the permeability is um, how these spaces are connected, um, which defines the ability to move fluids through the rock. So you kind of need both um, to move fluids efficiently. Um, as you can see here, this would be, for example, not, no pore space. Here we have pore space, but it's not really well connected. So these rocks can, can host a lot of fluids, but they can't really move them through efficiently. And here we have pore space that is more connected, so a higher permeability. So we get a sense that it's kind of important to be able to predict fractures, kind of knowing, um, especially in the subsurface where we can see them, um, what would be the fracture intensity? How many fractures would we get? Are they connected? Are they not connected? What is the porosity, the permeability? But um, fractures, fracture prediction is, is definitely not a straightforward um, process. Um, fractures often seem unorganized and random or complex with um, several sets of fractures. They're also not really useful indicators of rock deformation or kinematics as, as faults or folds or foliations, for example, would be. To me, understanding fractures often seems like trying to decipher background noise that is, that is happening in the background of a song, for example. Um, and honestly, until I did not join the industry, um, fractures to me was something I didn't even look for because I didn't think they were very useful. But we have to find ways to, to understand them, of course. Um, so what are really the challenges? Um, the challenges are that natural fracture orientations are often unrelated to present day stresses in, in a rock mass, but they reflect maybe stresses at the time of their formation. So kind of looking at the present day picture um, and trying to relate um, fracture systems to them might not always work. Um, regional stresses change over time. So we kind of have to go back and try to figure out what the paleo stresses were at that time. Also orientation and density of fracture sets may vary in space because of local stress um, regimes that are related to larger structures. So it depends on the position where you might be on a larger fault or on a larger fold system. Also fractures can form due to different processes. Not all the fractures we see are really related to tectonic stresses. There is compaction, lithostatic pressure, temperature changes, weathering, et cetera. So we have to try and really eliminate the ones that are not tectonic when we're trying to um, use them in a structural model. We also have very limited observation, um, a lot of indirect observation. Um, mostly we can only see fractures on the surface, but for example, they really fall through the resolution of seismic images or other um, geophysical data. They're just too small. So we have to use proxies. That means we have to use attributes that um, we can correlate to the intensity of fractures. And again, you can, you can think that this is not straightforward. But mostly also, um, I always like to think about scale, especially when we're looking at um, fracture distributions or intensity in well bores, for example. Um, we have to think of the scale we're looking at and the scale we, of the structures we're comparing these fractures to. <clears throat> So there are different types of fracture proxies we can use. Um, I would say the most uh, common um, type of fracture proxy is related to, to dip or curvature. So basically we assume that if, if rock layers have been bent or have been folded or are dipping in any way, they have experienced higher deformation than if they were not uh, folded or bent in, in, in some way. So that seems to be um, um, a, a pretty good indicator of fracture um, intensity. 
And again, there are all sorts of different sophistications we can go with this. And then, um, of course, um, we can also look at deformation, we can look at strain, we can look at stress, and we can look at um, other geophysical um, properties. So um, the case study I want to present is um, the Tipo Dome in Wyoming. And just for those of you who, who don't know the Tipo Dome area, um, it's just a, a beautiful four-way um, closure, um, doubly dipping, dipping anticline. But it's also been famous for political reasons. So Tipo Dome used to be um, the site of one of the largest, at least before Watergate, one of the largest political scandals in, in the United States. So Tipo Dome, Wyoming is mainly two oil fields, the Tipo Dome and the Salt Creek oil fields. Both are fractured reservoir types with a long history of production. And um, about a hundred years ago, um, there was a very big bribery scandal that involved the administration, um, the um, present, the, um, at the time um, government under President Harding. Um, so the oil reserves at Tipo Dome in, in, had been used and set aside for the US Navy because they were converting from coal fuel to oil powered vessels. Um, but then the Secretary of Interior, Albert Bacon Hall, um, he leased those petroleum, Navy petroleum reserves um, to uh, two private oil companies at low rates without a competitive bidding, accepting bribes. So he went to prison for that. Um, the whole administration um, kind of suffered under that. And after that, um, the Teapot Dome was put under oversight of the Department of Energy. And they were the ones that really made all these data sets available. So if you're ever looking for a good public data set, um, I mean, I've been in the industry for decades. I would say 80% of the work I've ever done, I've never been able to publish because of proprietary data. Um, Tipo Dome, you can just go online, you can, download anything anything you want from, from seismic to wells to geology, they, they have it all there. And a couple of years ago, 2015, um, it became private again and was sold to Stranded Oil Resources Corporation. So quite an interesting history. Um, so here's the location. Tipo Dome oil fields are located at the western edge of the Powder River Basin in central Wyoming. And it's part of a system of anticlinal traps that formed along, basically along the um, foreland of the Rockies during the late Cretaceous to mid-tertiary Laramide orogeny. Remember there is a severe orogeny that is more thin-skinned fallen frost belt and the Laramide came later is a more thick-skinned um, deformation. So these are basement cord anticlines. Um, they've been targets for hydrocarbon explorations for many, many years because a lot of them are doubly plunging. So they provide these beautiful four-way closures. Also notice um, um, the um, location of, of section AA prime, which we will be using in, in the study. Um, this is a digital elevation model of the Tipo Dome. Here you can see the, all this strike and dip data of the different formations. Um, and um, again, this is the anti, anticlinal fold axis, synclinal fold axis, and they're both plunging towards um, the north and, and the south. Underneath sits um, this basement called anticline, sits a blind reverse fault, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So these, this is a ge geologic map with the main um, stratigraphic units, the mostly terrestrial sandstone, marine, lacustrine, carbonates, and shallow shelf siliciclastic of Devonian to Upper Cretaceous ages. Um, the whole sedimentary sequence that sits above that um, Precambrian basement is about 2,200 meters thick. And the main producing oil reservoirs are the Shannon, 
um, the second Wall Creek and 10 sleep formations. Um, I think the 10 sleep is here, um, the blue one, yeah. Um, there are three prominent um, open fracture systems that have been described and a lot of work has been done, for example, by Lawrence and Cooper, and also here at the School of Mines by a number of um, graduate students. Um, the two main systems are hinge parallel and hinge, um, <clears throat> and hinge perpendicular. And then there is a third system, um, the blue one, which is kind of hinge oblique. Most of the fractures are bad normal extension fractures um, and kind of relate to that fault fracture model that um, is described by Stearns and Friedman in 72. Um, the maximum permeability has been described as mainly parallel to the fault hinge, locally also perpendicular, and specifically where we have the intersections of the two main <clears throat> fracture systems. <clears throat> So <clears throat> this is the Stearns and Friedman model. And of course, um, there are all, all sorts of um, um, new, new models that, that relate to that, but that is kind of the original model. So the fracture pattern is controlled by um, the folding of these sedimentary layers above the basement. And these faults have been classified as type one, a type two fracture set. And then we have that oblique fracture set that kind of doesn't fit that, um, that folding model, but probably has, has been described of probably being later and maybe not related to the, to the folding. <clears throat> um, here again, if we have, of course, different types of folding, we might get different types of fractal patterns too. So again, um, these models are not uh, straightforward. Um, so it depends on the dominant folding mechanisms, but you can kind of see here, what I'm getting to is that um, the different types of fractures might also depend on location in, in the folding. Are they in the hinge area? Um, are they in, in the limb area? Um, and of course, every type um, or orientation of these fractures sometimes also creates um, conjugate systems with it, with, with, which makes the whole thing even more complicated. But this would be typical for a concentric parallel fold. That means a fold where um, <clears throat> that is not very ductile, where the thickness is is kind of um, constant in the hinge and in the limb of, of the structure. So now uh, let's talk a little bit about the role of that fault. Um, we've seen the folding. The folding is really beautiful. You can see it in the seismic um, pretty well. Um, where does it come from? We said it's, it's laramide, it's probably thick skinned um, deformation. So um, we know, and I'll show that in the next image, that there is a fault underneath the tipodome anticline, probably controlling the geometry of, of that, that anticline. That fault does not breach um, all the way through those sedimentary layers. It is, it is a blind fault and um, has been interpreted in different, different ways. But um, what we have done is basically balance the interpretation, do a restoration and see which of the types of fault basically would fit um, the interpretation best. So if you look just at the bare bone seismic without anything else, you, you can see, and this is not, um, not a, a vertically exaggerated seismic. I always like to use it as is. Um, we can see the, the folding uh, pretty nicely. We have a shallow limb, a steep limb um, towards the west. And then we can, we can kind of see a fault coming through here. We can see some offsets, but here we don't see it anymore, right? It kind of ends somewhere in this area. 
And then down here is a big question mark. Um, where does this fall continue? So if we wanna do any type of modeling, we really need to know what happens with the fault in a depth. So cross-section balancing um, is a very old technique. Um, it's useful in a number of cases, especially in, in a case like that. It was first proposed by Chamberlain over a hundred years ago. And then uh, the concept was more developed and generalized by Dahlstrom in 69. But this was kind of one of the first um, cross sections that was used. We know now that it really doesn't balance very well. And because we have perfected the technique, we know now that um, we have to kind of use smaller areas to do, for example, um, depth to detachment interpretations. Um, what cross-section, the fundamental concept behind cross-section balancing is that an area or a volume remains constant throughout the deformation and the rock mass remains coherent. So that is um, achieved by applying a set of geometric rules of compatibility after Ramsey and Huber mainly. And basically it says the deformed state and the undeformed state should be the same or very similar. That means you can't have volume changes. I mean, if it's a few percent, we might still be good, but if it's more than that, like rocks that are highly metamorphic, for example, um, you'll get into trouble. Um, same when you balance with salt, you can do that, but again, you have to use a little bit of a different um, set of rules. The main reasons to balance is to validate our interpretation. Um, if you can't balance it, there's something wrong with your interpretation. If you restore it back in time and there are big holes between your different fault blocks or they overlap, then there's something wrong with your interpretation. So it's a good validation. You also get um, evolutionary time steps um, that you might need, for example, for paleospastic um, restorations or um, any type of um, um, thermal history. How we do it, um, I'm not gonna go into much of the detail, but the main technique is line length balancing, which means is like you take a rubber band that is folded and you stretch it out. Um, the length should be the same, right? If, if we get any length changes, that again means we are in a more ductile scenario or we have volume changes. So the depth, um, the length of the line should be the same. In some cases, um, it is not as easy to do. So we use area balancing. We just say, okay, we, we don't care what the shape looks like, but we want the area to be constant. Again, depends on the situation. Um, we have all sorts of rules to use. We, we use regional pins. That means we pin it in the least deformed area and then we undeform from there. Um, how we balance. Also, there are a number of tools that we use in balancing that are very useful and have been used in the study. For example, fault prediction. Um, there is a unique relationship usually between the hanging wall and the shape of a fault. And we can um, use that to our advantage. Um, um, the, the, the software I have used for this is Lithotect, courtesy of Holly Burton. And what it does is it runs several iterations behind the scenes to come up with a hanging wall that fits exactly that fault shape. And you can go the other way too. If you have a fault trace, you can forward model the hanging wall that fits that fault shape. Um, we can also use projection techniques. Um, if we have um, a specific geometry of a layer, we can project that using different kinematic models. We can calculate um, depth to detachment, et cetera. These are just some examples of single step sequential restorations. We can do backstripping, basically take off layer by layer as we go back in time. And we can also forward model. We can start with an undeformed model, go forward in time, 
and see how that fits our interpretation. And this is what we kind of did in, in our study here. So going back to our section, we can now, um, we added the wells. So we have pretty good control um, with well tops of the stratigraphy of the sediments. We can really see in the seismic some offsets. So we know there is a fault kind of in that area that is blind. But then we used um, fault prediction techniques to project the fault in depth using the geometry of this anticline. We used um, projection techniques and we came up with this interpretation. Um, for the forward modeling, we tried different things and ended up with a model because it is a blind fault and the layers are deformed above the tip of this fault. So that is why we used um, a model um, using tri shear kinematics. Um, that gave us the best results. Tri shear um, basically is, is a model that describes the deformation of rocks in front of a propagating fault. So we basically have a fault that is um, um, breaking through um, rock layers and the rock layers in front of the uh, propagating fault tip are deforming and tri shear is one way of describing that deformation and describes it in form of a triangle. And then you have all sorts of variation that are called PS ratio. How much does the fault propagate and how much does it actually slip? Um, so we have used these tools to set up an experiment. And the experiment was to forward model um, the fault, the reverse fault and the anticline as a tri shear scenario. So we're kind of starting and this is the kinematic type of modeling. So kinematics describes the deformation path or the motion causing geometries within rocks. So the rules of kinematics control how elements of interpretation move relative to each other. It's different to a mechanical model. It does not provide direct information on the effects of um, rock strength, overburden, pressure, temperature, and so on. But I will also show what we did with the mechanical model later on. And I have to hurry because time is clicking. All right, so then what we did is we started kind of with a fault down here. We calculated how deep the tip of the propagating fault might be. And then we just um, kind of added shortening in little steps to the model. You can see how the fault is propagating, how um, these layers are starting to fold in that triangular um, tri shear zone um, more and more. And then at the end, we have an evolution where basically the fault now is breaching into some of these um, sedimentary layers. All what we see underneath that is, that is all Precambrian basement. The next thing we did is we looked at um, modeling different attributes. Um, so with, with that, type of software, you can usually model, for example, um, the dip. This is all on the current present day geometry. We looked at distribution of dip. Um, and of course, we see that a warmer colors are higher dip. They are in the steep limb of, of the anticline. But then when we look at curvature, curvature is more in the hinge area of this anticline. And then we were also able to track strain. So when, when you want to calculate the strain, you need to know the original geometry and the end geometry. Only with a forward model, then you can calculate what the strain looks like between the original undeformed and the deformed state. That was another reason we did this forward model. So we calculated the strain, um, shear strain, extensional strain. I will explain in a second what it, I mean with cumulative strain. 
So we're trying to use strain as a proxy for fracture distribution. Um, here are the different strains we could track. Incremental strain is the increments of distortion, basically the strain that affects the rocks from one stage to the other. The imposed strain, basically. Finite strain is when you sum up all the incremental components at any specific point in the deformation history. How much distortion has there been at that point summing it up? Now, cumulative strain is different to that. It is the summation of all the incremental components from one step to the next, adding them up as absolute values. Um, I kind of like to think about um, if you think of, of a sphere or a ball and now you're compressing it one way, kind of in a, an oblate shape, that oblate shape um, is your finite strain. Now, if I apply a strain and I kind of reverse that um, back to a ball, my finite strain would be zero, correct? Because <laughs> I've, I've I've kind of compressed it this way, then I compressed it the other way, and um, my finite strain would be zero or very, very small. Now your, your cumulative strain would add up both strain events, and then it would come out as a very high strain. So why is that important? Because cumulative, cumulative strain represents um, basically everything that has happened to, to the rock. Right, you're accumulating all the strain and basically the damage done done to this rock. This is why we use cumulative strain. So here we can see how they change um, in the different steps of the forward modeling. Again, I'm not vertically exaggerating because I'm using the strain. So the differences are really, really subtle. Um, but you can see as we increase the folding, uh, we kind of left the fault out for this one. Um, we can see that um, there is a change in these um, strain patterns. And especially when we look at the cumulative strain, we can see how it, um, how it focuses more and more on the steep limb of the structure of, of that anticline. So it widens over time and it propagates kind of away from the hinge towards that steep limb. Um, when we look at curvature, it's a little different. So curvature, highest curvature tends to stay in, in the hinge area. It also kind of widens over time, which is normal because if you have a fold, it's kind of starting to develop and, and getting wider. So these are kind of interesting results. This is like a little summary. Again, you can see how subtle, but you can also see how, um, how the different fields kind of change in, in geometry a little bit. For example, here, um, the area of the lower, um, lower strains in, in blue, so higher strains are in red, um, kind of widens toward the top layers and becomes a little smaller toward the, the inner layers, which has to do um, also with, with that bending. So this is very much in, in line with, um, hold on, very much in line with um, classic folding, folding models of asymmetric folds, where basically we start developing an asymmetric fold as a symmetric fold in the beginning with, with kind of almost like a buckling. And then um, as we continue within that shear and the fold becomes more asymmetric, um, the, um, the steeper limb starts moving more um, toward, propagates more um, away from, from, from the tinge area and the, the higher strain area um, kind of does the same. So what does it mean for, for the wells? I mean, one thing is, is kind of funny when you look at the anticline, you look at all the wells and there are literally hundreds of wells that have been drilled there. You can really see how they're all aligned along the fold hinge. I mean, this is classically what we do, right? When we have 
a, a, a trap, um, a structural trap, a, a reservoir. We just um, tend to um, kind of look at the hinge area as, as the, the area of main um, accumulation. Um, and that's what's been done here. Um, this is a, a little map of that shows a little bit of the wall distribution and production, like with more production in the larger circles. And I mean, it is uh, subtle to be honest, but um, you can see some effects of cross faults in this area here with the larger bubbles. Um, this is kind of the area of our section. And, you know, you can, you can see that um, there, is, there are some larger um, producing wells more, a little more to the west of the anticline. Could it be because of cross falls? But it could also be because maybe there is better production in the steep limb. Again, this is, is kind of hard to, to really prove it. Okay. Um, the geomechanical model was done by Rockfield using Elfin software as a, a finite element modeling software. And again, there is not very much I can tell you about the details. I would have had my, my meet my co-authors here, but I can um, just tell you a little bit. So the mechanical modeling approach, again, is incredibly useful for understanding structural evolution, deformation history. So the main difference is that mechanical models are typically geometrically free. So you are not imposing a, a kinematic model, let's say like a tri shear or, or a flexural slip or a, a vertical oblique shear kinematic model. You're not imposing any kinematic model of, on it. It's basically just using the, the laws of physics and whatever that geometry that kind of falls out of that. So it's kind of free. Um, what we did in this is we, we really tried to combine the two models. So what they did, if I understood correctly, is you can see here, this is the outline. Um, they were using the outline of the kinematic forward models that I just showed you to constrain their um, geomechanical models. Um, that, that's, that's like a new workflow that we've been, we've been testing, trying to get really the best out of both worlds. Um, because I, I really think that um, both types of modeling are extremely useful and they both show different things that are very useful. But the question is always that's bothered me, how can we kind of use both of it. Um, so here was one trial, right? Um, they, they used the, the geometries of the kinematic models and integrated those into their um, geo, geomechanical models. Um, this is kind of um, one, one of their um, end products comparing kind of the, the, the key horizons Usually um, we have pretty good agreement, but one of the difference, if you um, remember the models I showed you, the just purely kinematic or geometrical models, um, all this was one unit because for the kinematic modeling, we can't really account for any mechanical differences. It's like we really, may don't make a difference if this is a very rigid carbonate or dolomite or it's a very soft shale. The only thing we can do is we can adjust the folding models. For example, um, in, the, in the software, we can say use flexural slip modeling for this type of rocks. So use um, vertical shear for the shales, for example. So, that's the only way we can control it, but we don't really acknowledge mechanical differences. Um, in the geomechanical modeling, you do, you do exactly 
exactly that. Um, and this um, is basically taking the same evolution, um, the same steps that we did with the kinematic modeling, um, showing in this case, the most tensile principle plastic strain um, at, at the same time steps. And you can kind of see, again, the higher strains are in the warmer colors, how the anticline starts developing. It's a little more convolute because now every layer is separate, right? Every layer will show a little bit of a different strain distribution, which makes the model look different than what I showed before. But at the end of the day, the results were kind of similar. We have um, this anticline starting nucleating. We have highest strain distributions here. And as the anticline becomes more asymmetric and develops, we have those higher strains propagate more into the frontal part, into the steeper limb of the structure. Um, and this is, I think, the most interesting one. Um, the results were very, very interesting, but they are the start of more work, right? I mean, it's one of those things where we're a like, yeah, we, 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 we tried these things and it showed really interesting results, but now we're gonna do a hundred more things. Um, so what this shows is um, one of the layers, um, actually two of the layers, but one is just really very, very thin. So let's just focus on the, on the, on the top one. So in the top one, the different colors show different orientations. So, the warm colors, the red and the yellow, are very steep fractures. The, the green and the blue are dipping fractures. Yeah, any, anywhere from 10 to 30, 40, 50, something like that. So if we look at the distribution, we can see that where the fold layers are more shallow, like in, in the shallow dipping limb and in the hinge area, we get more of the steeper fractures, steep or um, vertical fractures, like here and here, all the warm colors. When we look at to the, into the steeper limb in the frontal part of this anticline, we get more of the dipping um, fractures, which is kind of interesting. Now, the next image here underneath is different. This is time. So now it shows in the, in the cold colors, the blue and the green, it shows fractures that developed early. And in the yellows and reds, it shows fractures that developed um, late. So again, it's, it's not a very, not as consistent main, mainly uh, as the, the dip orientations, but um, you can kind of see that um, especially the blues, that means the very early fractures are again, a little off the hinge area. So more in the steep frontal limb of, of the anticline right here. And then the warmer colors later are more in the shallow limb. And then here, we don't know why it changes, honestly. Um, so interpreting this would kind of mean that um, the fractures in the steep limb, which are dipping, were developed earlier than the steeper fractures in the shallow limb and the hinge area. Um, it is an interpretation. Of course, we you know would need to to do more work, but I think it's very interesting. For what what does it exactly mean? Um, we're not sure. Maybe it means that uh, the fractures were steeper as they started with, and then they were rotated, or the other way around. Maybe they started um, as more shallow dipping, 
and um, and then they were rotated into a steeper position. Um, but it it sure is interesting, and um, and I think the next steps will will definitely go um, more in this direction, and also you know what would that mean for um, porosity and permeability. So in conclusion, um, I think in general, strain can be used as a proxy for fracture intensity and distribution. And in particular, if you use the cumulative strain, it um, will represent and track the total rock damage much better than um, finite strain, for example. Um, I think using a combination of mechanical and geometrical model should be what, what we're focusing on in, in the future. Um, this was, was kind of a, a clunky trial and a, an approach starting like for steps, how to integrate that. Um, I really hope more, more is coming that way. Um, the results look kind of promising, especially when we um, look at timing and orientation of fracture sets throughout a structural evolution. To me, the, the timing, I mean, I always talk about the 4D model um, because you kind of have to know how the structures evolved over time to really understand what happened to them fracture-wise, right? Um, it's also pretty clear that the structural position um, in a, in a fault system controls the fracture intensity. And that correlates again with, with the strain distribution. Um, future work should focus on expanding it to 3D, definitely. This was just done along a, a section um, and integrating it also into 3D mechanical models following kind of the same procedure. Um, there are of course limitations, for example, determining exactly fracture intensity is still difficult. Would we'll be able to kind of count how many fractures per area we have in, in the different areas. But um, hopefully um, there is more future development to that. Um, so if you're interested in reading more about this work and especially the geomechanical work, um, we actually just got this paper published. Um, we're very excited about um, the Journal of Structural Geology special issue that um, I got to edit together with um, three other editors, Herman Levitt, Stefano Mazzoli, and Georgi Gruic. Um, the four of us were um, among John Ramsey's last PhD students. So we kind of really have a very special connection to him. Um, he was such a great mentor. And um, the Journal of Structural Geology gave us the opportunity to publish the special issue. It just came out um, um, not too long ago, just a couple months ago. And um, our paper is, is one, of, one of the papers in there where you can learn more about this work. Um, and I just wanna finish with um, a picture of John Ramsey. As I said, he, he's been such an inspiring mentor and really laid the foundation for all this work that we've been presenting and, and much more. And I always have to, when I think of, of John um, and I think of, of this outcrop, which is in the Alps, a beautiful superposed fault pattern. And um, one of the first field trips, I was a, a student and uh, I was looking at the outcrop and trying to figure out all these folding faces. And, and John was just sitting there kind of looking at it. And, um, and I sat next to him, I said, well, what do you think? You know, it's like two folding faces and all this complexity. And he just looked at it, me and smiled and said, Catalina, just look how beautiful this is. <laughs> you know? So that's kind of stuck to me. Um, enjoy the beauty. And um, that's what I have for today. Thank you. So how do oh, I do Thanks, Catalina. Um, if anyone has questions, submit them into the, the Q&A box and Catalina will read them out and answer them in the order they come. Actually, I think I have to stop sharing to do that. Um, 
to good. All right, where are the questions? All right, okay. Um, can you develop fractures in a tectonically passive region just due to overburden of the above line sedimentary strata and how? Also, how would these fractures orient? So fractures are tectonically passive region just due to overburden. Um, I would say yes, um, those fractures would be um, probably controlled by um, lithostatic pressure. I would expect them to be kind of perpendicular to the bedding if the bedding is horizontal. Um, Dear Madam, thanks indeed for a valuable presentation. Could you please introduce your applied software? Okay, so the software I use is called Lithotect software. It is a structural balancing and restoration software that is owned by Halliburton. So um, I used to work for geologic systems and Lithotect and then it was sold to Halliburton and that's where um, we, we kind of worked further on the software. It's still available commercially as far as I know. Um, there is another software that is very similar. It's called 2D Move, um, is by Midland Valley. Um, now it's called Petex and um, 2D Move does very similar things than um, Lithotect, but mainly for balancing and restoration. Um, so could we say that balancing would never be 100% accurate since there are areas so strongly deformed that their physical properties or density of the layers change? So should this be one more assumption when we balance cross sections? Um, the physical properties change. Um, yes, of course. I mean, if you, if you are in an area that where rocks are very ductile, so you have a lot of volume change between for it, such as you can see between a fold hinge and a fold limb, for example, um, or it is a highly metamorphic area where we have, you know, a lot of fluid fluids flowing through a lot of volume loss um, that will definitely affect the balancing. Um, but if it's, again, if it's within a small limits, it, it might still be, be acceptable. Um, the work shown is really cool and interesting. Thank you. Particularly the orientation of the fracture and timing of the, if this work is published, would it be possible to post the reference? So yeah, it is, um, I mean, I can post it exactly, but it is the Journal of Structural Geology special issue um, volume in honor of John Ramsey. And that what I presented is the paper in that in that volume. Um, how did you validate the fracture prediction? Would it make any if you use move software? No. And so 2D move basically does the same thing as, as Lithotech. There would not be a, a big difference as far as I know. Yeah. In an extensional environment, where can one expect maximum? fracture intensity, how far away from the fault damage zone can the fractures develop? Uh, that is a good question, right? I mean, we know that as we get closer to, to any type of fault, um, intensity of fractures will, of course, increase. As we go away from it, it will, it will decrease, but I don't know, it's hard to say how much exactly because there are also different types of faults. You know, is it a reverse fault? How much is it a, uh, a thrust fault? Like how much shear is is involved? Um, I don't know, honestly, how to to answer that. Um, what else? What are your thoughts? How we can integrate this in seismic interpretation? Um, I'm not sure exactly what um, you're referring to in integrating what, I mean, all the balancing and cross-section balancing restoration was done using the seismic um, to interpret the structures and also to constrain our interpretation. Um, you can kind of see in, in, in the example I showed that um, the, the anticline um, 
is pretty well defined. The folding is well defined. We can see all the reflectors and the layers nicely, but the fold as we go in depth, we can't see it anymore. Um, we can't see the trace anymore clearly in the seismic. So that's why we use these balancing tools to um, predict what the fault trace would, would look like. Um, the fractures themselves, you're not gonna be able to see them in the seismic unless you have some very defined fracture corridors, for example, that disturb the reflectors in, in some way. Could it be possible that the fractures in the shallow hinge were rotated to a more steep dip? Yeah, that, that is definitely possible. Like I said, it's, um, I mean, this is data we got um, from, from using this workflow. Um, I think it's very, very interesting. I'm not exactly sure what it means. Um, we need to do more work, but it could definitely mean that um, the fractures have been rotated, especially the ones that we see in the in the steep limb. Um, what attributes on seismic would you recommend for high angle fractures? Um, what attributes uh, for high angle fractures? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not you have to use the attributes as a, as a proxy and um, you could use the dip or you could use the curvature or the strain. You know, it, it, it's hard to say because usually they represent fracture intensity and not so much the orientations. It's just in this mechanical model, we we're able to kind of look at the different orientations of, of the fractures. It, it did look to me like they were more prominent in the um, shallow limbs. My goodness, so many questions here. <laughs> Is the orientation of the modeled fracture similar to orientation of natural in the teapot dome? Um, yeah, so um, some work, I mean, work has been done in the outcrops of the teapot dome. Um, of course, what you can mainly see is um, the, the outcropping um, sedimentary layers that, that, that kind of form, you know, around um, the teapot dome structure. And um, from, from the fractures we can see, some of the fracture sets do um, coincide pretty well. But it's, it's a hard comparison. It's almost like apples and oranges because we're looking at one section. The work that has been done is really more in 3D, is really more around the whole uh, a, a teapot dome. And, and also one of the things we couldn't do really well with the mechanical modeling is um, several fracture sets. I mean, you'll realize that we look at fracture intensity kind of as a set of fractures. We can't really... Um, differentiate overlapping or you know intersecting um, fracture sets. Um, any advice for students using outcrop analogs to understand fracture evolution in space and time? Outcrop analogs, I'm not sure. Um, I understand what that means. Understand fracture evolution in space and time. Um, I wouldn't know how to do that from an outcrop. You know, you kind of need a structural model that then you embed the fracture evolution in. I mean, it, it comes back to the problem that um, the fractures we're looking at right now in the teapot dome might not be the you know, might not represent um, the stresses or the structures at the time of, of the formation. And, and you know, we, we don't know exactly when they formed. This is why we're doing the mechanical models, um, but it, it is kind of kind of tricky. Um, I have draft about effect of tectonic on fractures in two main reservoirs in Iran. Can I ask you to read this draft? Oh, yeah, do the team. Yes, please just send it to me. Very happy to do that. Um, so you should probably on the on the invitation to, to this talk, there should be my email. 
Um, so, you, you know, just uh, feel free to contact me anytime or if you have any questions. In lithotech, calculating finite and undeformed cumulative stress in the 2D section, not coming from, no, it's not coming from 3D. This was, is a purely 2D um, interpretation. Um, let's write a pattern evolution. Um, the units that are involved in the deformation. Uh, are we kind of running out of time here, I think? Yeah, Sorry. we'll make this the last question. Uh, as it's uh, one o'clock, you, you clearly have a very popular talk. Um, I invite uh, the audience if they have uh, further questions. I mean, we will, we will capture all of the questions in the Q&A and send them on to Catalina. And if you have further questions, uh, uh, we encourage you to reach out to her. Um, and, and we're very happy with uh, with your support of this talk. And Catalina, thank you so much. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, some of the questions, honestly, I need to think about it a little bit. <laughs> so. Um, I really encourage everyone to get in touch with me and I'll, I'll be happy to answer as much as I can. And, and thank you for listening, everyone. All right. Thank you, Catalina. Have a, have a wonderful day. Yes, you too. Bye.